Greetings from Sabil. Greetings from Jerusalem, um, dear friends. Greetings from a very cold Holy Land. Um, actually, we were expecting snow today. Only one centimeter to three centimeters of snow. It snowed for a few seconds, which is big news, at least here in Palestine. I'm sure it did not make it uh, um, the international news. Um, but the weather is... Uh, um, um, the coming few days will be the coldest for, um, since many years um, in Palestine and in the Holy Land. Um, today we have a very special guest with us. Um, last, um, in, before two years, Sabil started to work with, um, with the Palestinian Guides Union in a way trying to build with them um, periodic meetings or even sometimes they were actually more weekly meetings to meet innovators, to, um, to meet people with knowledge and insight on Palestine um, that are not usually included in the curriculum of teaching guides, um, tourist guides in Palestine and Israel. And we came across um, um, Anton Khalilie. Um, he is a person who has a strong passion for, um, for the environment, um, for the Holy Land, um, for Palestine. So it's an honor to have him with us, and um, I would like him to keep the tradition to, um, for Mr. Anton to introduce himself. Thank you very much, Omar. I do remember the, the lecture about the ecotourism that we gave, like I think it was uh, one and a half or two years ago. So my name is uh, Anton Khalaria. I hold a PhD in ecophysiology and ornithology. I did my uh, master's degree and PhD at Ben Gurion University in the Negev, uh, and I graduated back in 2016. I'm also bird watcher and wildlife photographer. Uh, I'm married. I have two kids: a daughter, her name is Mabel, and the son, his name is Chris. Uh, I'm originally from uh, uh, Beit Jala town in Bethlehem district. Uh, since 2016, I'm living in uh, in Ramallah with my uh, with my family. Uh, back in 2017, we established what we call the Nature Palestine Society. It is a local NGO uh, that uh, uh, its mission is to research, protect, uh, conserve, and educate about nature, biodiversity, and environment uh, in Palestine. Back to you, Omar. Thank you. Um, I have to admit, um, in Palestine, we have many challenges and many issues. And unfortunately, um, environment is not always, or um, environmental issues or the environment in general is not always the priority for us or for most of um, us as in Palestine. You are different. You're one of a very few group of people who really are trying to do something different. How come, when did you gain your passion for the environment? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, since I was a kid, I was really in love with nature. So I was like uh, near my home that we had really nice landscape. I used to go to the wild, like trying to even to catch some birds and you know, to, know, to know more about uh, nature. But in 2005, I started to, to work more and more and to read more about nature, about uh, conservation, about species. And I found that we as Palestinians don't know much about our environment. If we talk about the environment itself or nature or biodiversity, we didn't know anything about conservation. Uh, then I had the opportunity to do my master's degree at the University in the field of ecophysiology and uh, ornithology. From there, I start to understand that we have a huge gap uh, of, of lacking knowledge uh, about the biodiverse environment uh, in Palestine with all the efforts that were done by several other people even who talk about a governmental or non-governmental uh, organization. So doing my PhD as well, uh, my knowledge increased and I start to understand that we have a much bigger gap and lack of knowledge about uh, biodiversity, and we don't have any but any governmental or non-governmental organizations that focus on conservation and the real meaning of uh, of uh, 
uh, nature conservation or wildlife con conservation. Uh, so from there, we, we, we learned, I learned a lot about uh, all the importance and the values of, of biodiversity and all the values of, of conservation and why we need to, to start this huge step in Palestine of conserving uh, our nature, wildlife and biodiversity uh, in, in general. Uh, in adding to that ecosystem and all animals that provide ecosystem services like, for example, uh, the bees, which is a project that we are uh, running uh, uh, currently. Uh, being also in contact with the Environmental Equality Authority and uh, working with them uh, as a consultant on the writing uh, the fifth national report that was submitted to the uh, CBD Convention on Biological Diversity, I was the, the major ornithologist on this uh, on this uh, on this uh, uh, report. Uh, I found that really we are missing so much uh, information about the biodiversity. So from there came the idea for me and my colleagues to, to establish this Palestinian NGO that will focus on, on research, conservation, and education about nature and biodiversity uh, in, in general. Um, mo the more we see in Palestine, I mean, it is from different generations. It used to be Palestinians, I, I grew up during it was like our responsibility or something it is to pay attention more uh, details to um, to the environment even like with agriculture it was like we were we had a better relationship we we knew what was an almond tree a fig tree that's very different today um do you feel that they and since you work with different generations do you think the interest in the environment and in the um in palestine is is it shifting to the worse or to the better? Uh, at some levels, it is to the worse, and some levels, it is to the better. I'll give you an example. Uh, if we talk about the, uh, the, the governmental uh, uh, bodies that are dealing with the, with, the, with the environment and nature conservation, let's talk about the Environmental Quality Authority or the Ministry of Agriculture. They started to really work much harder on the environmental issues, especially after signing uh, several international conventions and agreements. And based on that, there are several uh, uh, things that uh, the, the Palestinians need to call with these uh, signed conventions. Uh, for example, uh, uh, writing or preparing the fifth or the sixth national report. Now, uh, the EQA is working on the six, writing the sixth national uh, 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 report is something very important for for all palestinians uh, to know more about what's what's going on so this is this is one part so and on the governmental level uh there's more increase of of uh, of the need to know more about uh, uh, the environment the biodiversity uh the conservation of of specific of specific animals but if you talk about the local people, or the local communities or individuals, um, in my opinion, uh, they are getting a bit more far from being attached to the environment or being more aware of the uh, environmental problems and issues that we are facing. And there are several issues why they are really disconnected in a way or another. Uh, the young generations now they are really trying to 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 find their jobs to to create their own opportunities to work, and uh, being a farmer, for example, doesn't bring you a good income in Palestine for for many reasons. So that's uh, the young generations they are really shifting toward uh, working either in Israel in construction or you know in IT or uh, uh, technology in general, and they are really going away from, from uh, the agriculture sector or from the environmental uh, uh, sector. Hopefully this is will not continue because if this is will continue, then we're gonna have much more uh, problems. For, let, let me give you an example. We have about 10 bird species that went extinct from, from the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, we have about, uh, 
uh, 23 invasive alien plant species uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, we have about four invasive uh, alien bird species. We have many, many invasive alien insects. Uh, and unfortunately, no one is focusing on these uh, issues. Let's talk about the invasive species in general. Uh, the, we don't have any university that have a specific courses or specific uh, degrees that dealing with invasive species or even in biodiversity or conservation. So these are really problematic issues that we, as a Palestinians, we need to face soon, soon or later. Uh, invasive species, uh, they imposing major threats on the human health on uh, agriculture sector, on economy, uh, they might even transmit disease. So this will cost us as a Palestinians at, the, at the, the governmental level or at the community level or at the individual level, it will cost us money. It will cost us uh, uh, several diseases, for example. So this is something that we need to deal with as soon as possible. We need to bring back these young generations to think about the environment in a, in a different way. Um, I mean, it's a serious challenge for people who, are to, who rely on agriculture, because in, like, in the West Bank is divided between area A, area B, and area C. And I mean, in area C, there's many settlements, settlements and it's many of these settlements have free access to water, um, uh, they, they have like, I mean, it is, it's many economic incentives, like um, um, to, to establish or to preserve their businesses. Um, our farmers in area C and, uh, and in area B, sometimes it's, they, they don't have, I mean, the basics. Um, that's a serious. This is, this is very serious issues that you are facing. Even, even people in area C, they don't, they, they don't have the right to access their land. Uh, they don't have the right to establish their own small uh, uh, sheep houses, for example, or places where they can keep their, their uh, It is a major problem that we are facing. Adding to that, uh, since the principal authority doesn't have control in Area C, any illegal actions against the environment or nature in general in Area C, uh, Brazilian authorities, they can't control these actions because they, are not, they, are not, they don't have an access to, to Area C. So yes, uh, Area C and Area B, it's a major issue for, for us as a Palestinians that we have no right to access in a way or another. It is controlled by the Israeli army. It is um, most of our nature reserves, about 84% of the nature reserves in, in, in the West Bank, they are located in area C. Most of the key biodiversity areas are also located in area C. So whatever actions that we need to take, it is depending on how much access we have to, to area C. Adding to that, 38% of nature reserves are overlapping with Israeli military bases. 33% uh, of nature reserves are overlapping with, uh, with Israeli settlements. Adding to that, in some cases, the Israeli settlers, they are building their new settlements, either close to nature, to, to the nature reserves or within the nature reserves. Take, for example, Wadi Fana. Wadi Khan is one of the most beautiful nature reserves in the West Bank. It's located in the Mediterranean uh, 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 climate uh, region. But within this nature reserve, there are about 11 uh, Israeli settlements just surrounding these nature reserves or close to these nature, this nature reserve, or even within the border of this nature reserve. So the question that even the Palestinian Authority is asking, if this is a nature reserve, why? Israel is building settlements within or close to these nature reserves. So in, in general, area C and B is making a big challenge for us to, to do uh, uh, any work or research related to conservation and biodiversity, adding to that in agriculture or even having a good infrastructure in this, uh, in this area. Which adding one thing, uh, Omar, uh, Area C, is, I think it's about 62 or 63 percent of the of the West Bank area. 68. Thank you for correcting me. So we're talking about 68 percent of, of the West Bank, which is about 6,000 square kilometers, is, is under Israeli control. This is a big challenge 
for, for, for us as a conservationist or uh, people working in biodiversity. Um, I just want to go back um, because you've mentioned that a number of uh, birds and uh, animals and even plants have got extinct. It's very nice when it comes to the Holy Land because we have the Bible. Um, the Bible, yeah. I mean, a very old document. It mentions the flora, fauna, the animals, and so on. Um, um, I know that you know nature and you know the environment and you know the animals very well. I don't know how much you know what the Bible, it's a big book, but um, what animals still exist um, or what animals used to get uh, used to exist and got extinct or birds? Or... Oh, that's a big question. Uh, if you want to go to the, to the Bible and look at what species have been mentioned, we just need to keep in mind that at that time there was no uh, taxonomists that will say the specific uh, uh, classification of each species. For example, uh, the dove was mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in the Bible, but which dove? We have several doves. We have the laughing dove, we have the uh, namaqua dove, we have the collar dove, we have the turtle dove. In some cases, the specific species was mentioned, for example, the turtle dove. The turtle dove is one of the, uh, the, the migratory species that pass through uh, the Holy Land uh, twice a year during the spring migration and the autumn migration. But at the same time, some populations do breed uh, in, in the Holy, Holy Land. However, these species do still exist until today, but it is, its number, it, the population uh, uh, worldwide it, is decreasing and now it is listed at the uh, 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 IUCN uh, red list. Let's talk about the lion. The, the lion was uh, at some point was existed in, in the Holy Land, uh, but it went extinct, I think, in the 15th century, if I'm not mistaken. But we can see some documents from Marsaba Monastery mentioning that the, the monks there, they're witnessing the, the lion uh, passing through the, the, the Jerusalem wilderness, through the desert area. Um, let's talk about the leopard, for example. The, the leopard, we have two subspecies of the leopard. The Bible doesn't say which one uh, or which one exactly uh, talking about, but we had two subspecies, the northern one and the, the southern one. The southern one, the northern one, uh, I think it went exit in the 1960s, but the uh, the southern one, which is more of the desert species, it is a smaller uh, leopard. Uh, the last evidence of this species was back in 2010. And I do remember uh, in Zdebuker uh, campus that belongs to, um, which is part of the Bern University where I studied, uh, in 2007, uh, uh, an old uh, leopard was very weak and sick, uh, was looking for food at, at one of the houses and he entered to catch uh, a, a, a cat. But the, the owner of the house, he managed to capture this, uh, this leopard. And uh, I think it was uh, sent to, um, to, uh, to a vet in, in Israel, but uh, unfortunately it passed away because it was really an old, uh, uh, old animal. Um, we have also some, uh, some birds that were mentioned in the, the Bible. If we talk about um, uh, the vulture, for example, uh, the vulture is one of the biggest uh, uh, birds that we have. Its wingspan can reach up to three meters. So this vulture uh, was mentioned in the, in the Bible. It still exists in the Holy Land, but unfortunately, it went extinct from the West Bank uh, area. So we don't have this, uh, the, this uh, uh, griffin vulture anymore in the West Bank, but still in a small numbers, we can see it in the, in the Zebuker uh, uh, area. We can see it in, a, in, in Gamla in the, in the north. Uh, another vulture was mentioned is the, the Egyptian vulture. Uh, still exists, but in small numbers, its number is decreasing. And I think it is listed as the IUCN uh, red list. We had also the golden eagle was also mentioned. Its uh, situation is really critical. Um, um, a few pairs remaining 
the breeding in, in the Holy Land. Uh, we have also the Verwax eagle used to breed in the desert area, but it went extinct as a, as a breeder. Uh, I think during the, 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 the 70s. Um, we have uh, uh, plants as well that were mentioned in the, in the Bible. Uh, let's talk about the iris species. So in the Bible, I think it is mentioned as an iris species, but we have several iris species. We have, uh, which is most likely the one that was mentioned in the Bible, it's called Iris Palestina, uh, which is still exists uh, uh, in good numbers in the wild. But we have other iris species, which we call the royal irises. Uh, most of them are uh, really endangered and listed at the IUCN red list. They are listed at the uh, national also red list, like for example, the Iris uh, Lortitiae, Iris Heine, Iris Atrophisca. And by the way, we had uh, an IC project, a conservation project, that's supported by the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund and the BirdLife International to conserve uh, the Iris Atrophisca, which we didn't know much about its distribution in the West Bank area. So through this project, we managed to focus on this species to study its distribution in the West Bank. And we created uh, what we call in situ conservation site in Tamun area, which was one of the best places for this species uh, uh, that flourish in that, in that, uh, in that uh, 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 site. Uh, we have other species that mentioned in the Bible, plant species, which we consider today as invasive species. I don't know, I don't think invasive species existed back then, two or three thousand years ago. For example, the, the castor oil plant, it is a species that is more uh, endemic to, to Africa. But uh, uh, the Egyptians, they spread this, this plant in different places, and one of them is, is the Holy Land. But this species is considered as a, an a invasive species that has several uh, uh, threats, that impose several threats on the biodiversity and the human as well. But it, people like them, they used to extract its oil and to be used in several, uh, several uh, uh, ways. So the Bible mentions several plants, several animals, several mammals. Some of them do still exist. Some of them are really uh, endangered or threatened. Some of them increase in their, in their uh, numbers. In addition to that, in the Bible, there are several, uh, many plants or, or animals even were mentioned, but they are not part of the natural uh, biodiversity in the, in the whole world. What about bears? Did bears exist in the Middle East? Yes, we, and I think we still have it until today, but not in the Holy Land, the, the, the Syrian bear, which we can see it in, uh, in zoos. Uh, and Alpelia Zoo, for example, they have the Syrian bear, which is a species that uh, existed in the Holy Land. I think now we can only see a few individuals, for example, in Syria, Lebanon, I'm not sure about Turkey, but yes, we had the Syrian bear, which is really majestic animal. And the Khalkilia, um, at Khalkilia Zoo, there is this bear? I've never seen it. Yes, it is there. I just saw it uh, six months ago. Oh, still there. Yes, it is, it is a really unique bear. Um, I want to ask you, um, maybe because I mean Syria, the, you know, the, the whole region was one part, um, one country or one piece of land. Did the divisions in size peak with the British and the French dividing it and drawing borders, and um, and later on uh, um, um, establishment of the state of Israel? Did how, what effects did it have on the biodiversity in the region? Wow, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> but it has it has really really major major problems. <clears throat> First of all, nature doesn't know uh, borders. This is something that we need to understand and right? The same as environment. 
environment doesn't know, doesn't recognize uh, borders. So, for example, if a, if a catastrophic problem uh, happens in, in Lebanon, we will suffer from it. That's, that's a fact. Uh, for example, take, uh, take the, uh, the Hula, the Hula Valley, okay? The Hula Valley before the establishment of Israel, before the creation of Israel, it was a really nice swamp and many animals existed uh, uh, there. Uh, but after the drainage of, uh, of, this, uh, of this swamp, uh, several animals uh, went extinct and plants, and even frogs. Um, for example, the white-tailed eagle used to breed in that area and flourish in that area, but it went extinct. Uh, there was so much effort to bring it back, but it didn't work out. And the last one was uh, uh, found dead, uh, I think, a couple of months, uh, months ago. Um, let's take another example. Building the separation wall um, put some animals in, uh, in, 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 in environmental pressure. Let's give, me a, give you an example. Let's talk about the wild boar. The wild boar is a species that existed and it is native to, to our region. But as you, as you might know, Omar, that the wild boar now uh, is really increasing in number like crazy, and it's uh, many, many farmers, many people are suffering from from the uh, from the increasing number of, of the wild boar. It's affecting the agriculture. Uh, many people were injured, and one of the major reasons for for the increase in the wild boar's number in the wild is that they don't have access to move as, as they used to do before the separation. Uh, so some population are isolated in the West Bank, for example, and their number is increasing. At the same time, um, the, the, the uh, nature in, in the West Bank, we lost uh, their major uh, predator, which is the, the Indian wolf. So their numbers is increasing and nothing is suppressing their, their uh, uh, numbers. So this is, this is a major or a big catastrophe for, for us in the West Bank. The number also of the wild boars increasing in, in, in Israel, for example, but the, the consequences of this increase is much more uh, in the West Bank, uh, West Bank uh, area. Um, these fences and this, uh, uh, or this separation wall also affecting the, the plant uh, uh, diversity. Let's take the iris hiney which is one of the royal iris, that it is endemic only to Gilboa, Fakua, and Jalabon area. We are talking about 20, 30 square kilometers of uh, area that's shared between uh, the West Bank of Palestine and Israel. But at the center of this side, Israel built the separation wall um, that spread between uh, the eastern part of, of, um, of Gilboa Mountain uh, with the with with the Jalabon and Papua, so this plant only exists in the whole world within this 20 to 30 square kilometer. But destroying the habitat there affects the, the the population of of the iris uh, uh, hiney, and it became more in in endangered species. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, one thing that was very interesting for me when you delivered your presentation to the guides union um, uh, a year or so ago, I was very much shocked with the news that there's so many natural reserves in Palestine. And yeah. I, would like to sh um, I would like to, for us to share this information again, if it's possible with our panel. Yes, uh, we have, uh, let's say it in this way, uh, between 1967 and 1994, Israel declared 48 nature reserves in the West Bank area. We will add to that a new nature reserve that uh, the Palestinian Authority declared, uh, I think in 2005, six which is Wadi Gaza. And in 2019, a new nature reserve was declared 
in uh, Jinsa food area. The last one, it's just a small pool. I think it is, it is less than uh, maybe three donums. Uh, but within this, uh, this pool, natural pool, I don't know if we call it pool or swamp, it's a really little uh, uh, area that has two uh, important and endangered species. Um, uh, uh, a frog, I think it's called the Syrian toad frog, and another uh, plant do exist there. However, um, more than 80% of these nature reserves are in area, uh, which is a big issue for us as a Palestinians that we cannot uh, uh, manage, we cannot work within these uh, nature reserves. In some cases, even we don't have access to these nature reserves. In other cases, we could have an access, but we, may, we, we, we must pay a ticket to go inside these uh, nature reserves, for example, the Fashra area, which is close to the Dead Sea. It is now controlled by Israel. It is managed by the Israeli authority. And as a Palestinian, if you want to go there, we go there as a tourist. So we cannot conduct a research there. We don't know much about this nature reserve. Uh, another issue about these nature reserves is that we don't know why Israel declared these areas as a nature reserve. Being a nature reserve, this means that you cannot develop these areas. You cannot have any, um, you cannot build houses there. You cannot touch this area. It's a nature reserve. But when we are talking about 48 nature reserves, which I think uh, uh, comprise about 12 or to 13% of the total area of the West Bank, this is a huge, a huge number. And the question is why these are nature reserves. If these are nature reserves, this is, a, this is something that the President of Earth keep mentioning at the uh, national and international level, why Israel is building settlements near or within these nature reserves. Uh, I'll give you an example that is happening right now. There is a small nature reserve in Hebron. It's called al Qarim, And Israel now is uh, constructing uh, a, a new road uh, close to road uh, 60, uh, which pass through the eastern part of this nature uh, 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 reserve. So we do have plenty of nature reserves. Uh, it's about 12 to 15 percent of the West Bank. Uh, we are not talking about huge areas, uh, but still we have a good number of nature reserves. But unfortunately, until now, we don't know as a Palestinians why these are. Uh, declared as a nature reserve. Uh, 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 last year, uh, the Environmental Equality Authority received the grant from the Critical Aid Ecosystem Partnership Fund organization uh, to reevaluate the nature reserves at least within area A and uh, B. And we, as Nature Palestine Society, we are part of this team that is working. Uh, on the evaluation of these nature reserves. And hopefully we will have a manage management plan for uh, these nature reserves, which I think there are nine, eight or nine nature reserves in area A and area uh, B. Um, before we started the meeting, we were chatting about, um, about the interesting and um, and amazing projects that you are planning and some plans that you were already um, considering before COVID came, unfortunately. Part of it was bird watching or maybe um, um, special tours very much related to ecotourism. Can you give us an update on what things um, you have done in the past? I know some of our friends here um, have led groups into the country or, um, or might be joining a group coming in the near future. What are opportunities for people to, um, to engage with you, your organization? Okay. Um, part of the things that we are doing uh, uh, as an NGO, we are conducting a comprehensive uh, survey uh, on the biodiversity of the West Bank area because it's very difficult for us to go to Gaza, but hopefully we will, we will be able to do that soon. 
so we are conducting a survey uh, about the, the avifauna or, or the birds of the of the west bank. This is this is one part. This is something that we are con uh, we are doing without um, uh, a financial aid or a grant. This is something that we are doing by ourselves. Uh, we we need to know more about the avifauna or the birds or the birds diversity uh, in the in the West Bank area. Uh, we also uh, doing conservation uh, 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 project. Uh, for example, the uh, the CDF uh, funded a project about the iris at Rutiska. So what we have done, we conducted a comprehensive survey in the West Bank area, trying to understand. And to examine this species and to understand its uh, natural distribution in the West Bank area. On the other hand, we also uh, conducted several workshops and uh, public awareness uh, campaigns to protect and conserve this uh, this species. In addition to that, we established an in situ conservation site specifically for this uh, iris uh, species. Uh, to, to be uh, protected and conserved in its natural uh, habitat in what we call Jabal Hormon uh, uh, Nature uh, uh, Reserve. We are also now working on um, identifying uh, specific trails that will be part of uh, ecotourism activities, hopefully starting from uh, uh, September or maximum spring of 2023. Uh, we are studying these uh, trails that uh, are basically within the central and northern parts of, uh, of the West Bank uh, uh, area. In addition to that, uh, we are um, uh, building the capacity for several uh, uh, individuals, Palestinians, that are uh, into, into birds and birding. So we'll be able uh, to host tourists uh, or bird watchers from all over the world that would like to come and join us for bird watching activities, to know more about uh, uh, the West Bank area in general, to know more about the birds, about uh, different uh, communities uh, within the West, uh, West Bank uh, area. This is something that uh, we needed to, to start because uh, we, we think that um, uh, bird watching is really uh, uh, a big business in the, in the international world in general. Um, and uh, uh, bird watching can be uh, 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 a job opportunity for several Palestinians that have the passion for, uh, uh, for, for, for birds and for uh, biodiversity uh, in, in general. So hoping that by September we will start these uh, these uh, uh, bird watching uh, tools in the, in the West Bank area. And so far we, so far we, we managed to, to record about uh, 370 bird species in the West Bank area. Some of them, um, I can say about 70 to 80 uh, uh, bird species, they were uh, located uh, once or twice or three times for the last uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, but the other bird species that we can see uh, uh, all year around, some of them all year round, like uh, breeding, uh, resident breeding species. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, Palestine is located as a major cross area uh, for migratory uh, birds from Europe to, to Africa. So we can see uh, thousands of thousands of, uh, of uh, soaring birds, for example, within five to 10 minutes in specific areas, just passing uh, through, uh, through Palestine. So I think this is really a very interesting uh, uh, phenomena that many bird watchers would like to, to come to the Holy Land and see uh, this uh, magnificent uh, uh, migration, for example, for the soaring birds or or maybe some bird watchers are looking for specific species that they know that they are existing, for example, in the, in the, in the, in the Holy Land. Some bird watchers from Europe or from America, they are interested in desert species. And as you know, we have the desert, we have the, we have the Mediterranean areas, we have the steppe areas, uh, we have the uh, different biogeographical zones that 
have, that enrich the biodiversity and enrich the avifauna of, of, uh, of Palestine. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have we have some questions in the chat. Um, I will try to address them. Um, um, Bethlehem University and Dr. Mazen Komstia also do um, uh, um, to a certain extent maybe some similar work. Is there any cooperation? Definitely, definitely. There is, there is a lot of cooperation between us and the Palestinian Museum of Natural History that was established by Professor Mazen. Uh, Actually, back in 2016, I worked for this museum for about six months, and we're still in cooperation until today. So we're sharing knowledge, we're sharing expertise, we're sharing uh, many, many things that's related to, to our joint uh, work. Um, as, as a country very much well, uh, I mean, very much connected with faith and religion, um, do you think religion plays a role, whether it is the Muslim faith, Christian faith, or the Muslim faith, in paying attention to the environment and its conservation, or um, or maybe it's a, it's a challenge? Um, it is a challenge. Why it's a challenge? Because uh, people who are responsible for these three religions, I don't want to just mention specific names or specific uh, uh, hierarchy of these religions, uh, they don't give much attention for the environment and biodiversity. Um, I think it's basically because they lack the knowledge about these things in, in a way or another. This is how I think about it. The other thing, they have other things to talk about. If they are prayers on Fridays or Sundays, or they have other things to talk about. Not that they don't focus on, on, on conservation, but using the religion or not using, I don't have to say it in a different way, using the religion, the concept of, of, of the religion to conserve and protect the nature and biodiversity, this is something really important for us in the Holy Land. But unfortunately, it's not uh, used in the right way for, for, this, uh, for this purpose. But hopefully this is something which we should work on uh, soon. Um, there are certain farms in the West Bank or in the Bethlehem area that like the tent of nations who have their own small very micro basic projects with um with paying attention to the environment and, uh, and maintaining the environment and the biodiversity but they remain very small projects and so on um is there something that's like a national plan in palestine that deals with um with all of the different issues um on a macro level the Palestinian body that works on these issues is the Environmental Equality Authority. And uh, I'm sure they are doing their best, but uh, their best is not enough to conserve or to protect the biodiversity and nature or the environment in the West Bank areas for many, many reasons. One of them is lack of funding. This is something that we are really uh, need in the, in the West Bank area. There are several organizations and institutes in, in, in the West Bank or in Palestine that are working on on the biodiversity issues, uh, it's either research or conservation or education or protection. But these are, as, as you mentioned, they are on really small scale, uh, but uh, they are important. They are important steps, but what we need is a major large scale steps by the Palestinian government to work on all these issues. They are doing their best. They are they signed several uh, uh, conventions uh, that, uh, related to uh, conservation and environmental protection and nature reserves like the CPT as I mentioned earlier, but still we are at the uh, early stages of, of, these, uh, of these actions. And one of the major issues or uh, obstacles that we are facing as an as institute or as, a, as the Palestinian government is, is in a way or another is the occupation. We, as, we, as we mentioned, we, we don't have and access to area C, which represents 68, 68%, 68% of, the, of the West Bank area. So where to do the conservation? Area A and area B, they are mainly built up Palestinian areas. So most of the nature reserves, most, most of the, uh, the rangeland, they are in area C. So that's why I'm saying we are doing what we can, but we still are facing uh, many obstacles that don't allow us to proceed as we we would like to, to, to do. 
Uh, another thing that we are facing, which I think I mentioned earlier, but I'm going to focus on, is uh, the illegal actions that is uh, uh, conducted, for example, by the Palestinians in Area C. No one is, is really uh, can do anything to these people because they are living in Area C. The Peninsular 30, they don't reach Area C. In addition to that, um, or beside that, uh, we as, uh, as a Palestinian institute or NGOs were trying to help in this. For example, we are planning to establish the first Palestinian rehabilitation uh, center for, for wildlife. Uh, one of the things that we, we are so happy on and proud that we managed to do is, is that we managed to confiscate a very endangered raptor species from a hunter that uh, hunted this, this bird in Area C. This bird is what we call the Bonellis eagle. It is a critically endangered species and is listed as a Palestinian uh, national red list. We managed to confiscate this species with the tourist uh, police, with the help and support of the Environmental Quality Authority. Uh, we managed to rehabilitate this species and with the support of many, many people, we worked together on, on the rehabilitation and treatment of this species. And we managed to put a GPS uh, telemetry on this species uh, back in 2018. And until today, this species is still roaming around and we know exactly what this species is, is doing. So this is one of the things that we are planning to do for the next year is to establish the first Palestinian rehabilitation center for, for uh, wildlife. Um, so we have a question is that whether Israel have also participated in climate agreements and signing such agreements and making the commitments. Um, if yes, is there space, I mean, or place throughout, I mean, since both Palestine and Israel have signed these agreements in a way to find or to, um, to find ways how, somehow to do our best to exclude the climate and the environment from the political struggles? I'm, I don't know if Israel signed the CPA, CPD convention, for example, but I think they, they did. But you cannot separate the political situation from the environment and from nature conservation. You cannot. Like, uh, in, in some cases, there was a, a, a joint work between the Palestinians and the Israelis on several environmental issues, but it all depends on the political situation or the political conditions. So, this is a question that is not easy to, to, to answer, but whenever there is a kind of collaboration between both sides, they work together on the environmental issues, but again, it depends on the political uh, situation. Um, we have a question, a practical question. If people are um, in the country and they would like to get on, a few, uh, on some of your tours when it comes to ecotourism, bird watching, and so on, <laughs> How can they find out the information when these trips take place? Uh, we're going to publicize everything on our website and uh, on our Could Facebook. you put it on the chat? Or, um, I think Ryan can also help us with this, but if it's, there's a place to register for your newsletter or, or something, I think some of the people would appreciate it. Yeah, I will, uh, I will add uh, the website. So, um, and I don't know if it's, um, we understand, I mean, um, the complexity of the situation in Gaza, but what's the, um, the situation in Gaza? Is it different from the West Bank? Uh, or anyone working there? Um, I think there are some organizations and universities that work on on, uh, on research in the biodiversity uh, field or conservation. Uh, I don't know much about what's really happening there, but the question is, do Gaza, area Gaza Strip still has uh, some natural areas? It's uh, one of the most populated areas uh, in the world. And if you talk about what the Gaza Nature re re Reserve, it is now polluted with wastewater that's uh, coming from all settlements of the Hebron area, and then the, 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 the sewage from from, uh, from Gaza area itself, and then it goes directly to the, to the Mediterranean. 
Um, I think the, the environmental situation is in Gaza is very difficult uh, at all levels. It's, uh, it's not comparable to the situation in, in, uh, in the West Bank uh, area. Um, I mean, last week it made it to the news in, uh, on major news outlets about Palestinian farmers or Palestinians getting arrested in the West Bank for picking a coop. I don't know what Hakub is in English. Got that? Yeah. Got um, uh, so um, Israel claims that these um, plants are are endangered species. Palestinians claim that this is something that is part of our traditional food, and there's plenty of it all around the West Bank. What's your opinion? Well, Hakub is an important. Uh plant uh, for human consumption, as well as for uh, wildlife or for animals in general, especially for some uh, birds like the, uh, the golden finch. So in a way, um, the, the population of this akub plant is decreasing in the wild because of, of uh, people are picking these, uh, these plants. Uh, but at the same time, it's a source of, uh, of income and a source of food for, for, for the Palestinians. Uh, so it's a, big, uh, it's a big dilemma how to deal with this situation. One thing is that the plant is really uh, disappearing at the same time. It's, uh, it's important as an economical uh, 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 or a source of income for some Palestinians who pick this plant and sell it in the, in the market. Um, but what I know that recently uh, farmers start to to plant this uh, this uh, plant in their uh, their fields, and uh, we will start to to see this uh, this um, uh, vegeted, vegetables call it in the in the market uh, uh, this year. So hopefully people will stop picking it up from from the from the field. I can't hear you. Oh, yes. Yeah, now I hear We're running out of time, but I think we have two questions. One question is, for people who want to do um, bird watching, um, wh where are the most popular areas that one can do bird watching here in, um, in the West Bank or inside Israel? The question is what this bird watcher want to see. If this bird watcher want to see the migration, or the migration of the soaring birds, then they must be in specific places in the West Bank or even in, the, in, in Israel. If you want to see some uh, uh, waders or water birds, then we have several other several places to, to see. This bird watcher, you just need to contact us and tell us what you want to see, and we will take him for this uh, a tour to see the, the birds that he, he or she looking uh, for. Um, I mean, we had at least an attempt to hold elections in Palestine um, um, last last year, but it did not materialize. However, it has been um, when political parties or um, lists, election lists, were were, um, were preparing their uh, um, their plans to run and what they aim to do. I don't think that in, um, in out of the 20 different lists, the environment the environment was not even on a single list um, as a priority um, or as part of their uh, their plans. Is there plans to be to somehow to organize or to um, for groups who are interested in maintaining um, the, eco, uh, the environment or the biodiversity in Palestine to organize at when elections take place so that they can influence in an organized uh, manner um, decision makers? By the way, Amar, I, I, I didn't hear much of what you just said. I don't understand why, but I, I lost you. Can, you. can you please repeat the question? Yes. Um, when it comes to, um, to elections and the priorities of political parties or advocacy groups, mm. are 
um, are there attempts to organize in a way to decision, uh, I mean, to, 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 to lobby together to advocate for, for the environment and the protection of the environment within the Palestinian society or political parties? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think this is something that is, is happening or is going to happen in the, uh, among the Palestinians uh, in the near future, because all parties, they have several agendas that are not connected to, to the environment. This is how I think uh, uh, about it. Um, so I think it's something that it should happen. For example, we don't have a Green Party uh, among the Palestinians. So I don't think... Uh, the, these parties are, uh, th their major focus is going to be the environment anytime soon. Uh, they need to deal with, with other things, they need to deal with the political situation, political situation, the occupation, uh, other things. But I think the, the, the environment and the biodiversity and nature, it's, I think it's in, the, in their least uh, priority, unfortunately. One major thing that we always, I mean, it is, it's um, Israel made a mistake after, I mean, 19, after Nakba and after the establishment of state of, uh, of the state of Israel, they started to do uh, the introduction of foreign plants and so on. And I mean, every year or every, every other year when a major fire breaks out in the country or, I mean, um, problems come, Israel has realized that they have made um, major mistakes when it comes to the environment. Are we learning um, from the mistakes of Israel or are we just repeating them or we're just completely not paying attention? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't think we learned the lessons from the, the Israeli mistakes regarding the environment. Um, I'll give you an example about these things. Um, Majority of the invasive plant species that we uh, that we talked about, uh, they were brought uh, by the Israel or the British mandate um, for different reasons. One of them is to uh, for land uh, uh, reclamation, for example. But unfortunately, uh, we as the Palestinians, we started to plant these trees uh, in, in 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 the West Bank uh, area because we thought that this is the way how to make. Uh, the land more green by planting these trees. These invasive plants or uh, trees, they grow very fast and they, within two or three years, you will have a tree of very small uh, uh, seedlings. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't learn uh, the lesson from, from these mistakes. And Israel, I think, they start to realize that this is a, this uh, actions are a, a big mistake since we start to have these huge uh, uh, fires and having these plants turning into invasive alien species that affect the environment, that affects the agricultural sector, that affects the, the economy in general, that affects the human health. But I think um, uh, uh, a, a year ago, the Environmental Equality Authority, they start to work on the invasive uh, species. And we, as Natural Palestine Society, we, are, we took the consultancy of, uh, of preparing the first Palestinian uh, national plan uh, to deal with the, with the invasive species. Uh, and one of the major recommendations that we, we will deliver or submit to the Environmental Quality Authority and the Ministry of Agriculture that we need to stop planting these invasive uh, uh, trees, trees, uh, trees, which in fact, the agriculture ministry, they start to have a different uh, direction and, um, in, uh, in uh, uh, planting these trees. Uh, for exa example, they start to grow the native trees and they start to plant these native trees instead of the invasive uh, uh, trees. Thank you very much. I mean, it is it's, um, for us um, as we're uh, um, in land um, um, around the world, it's nice to be um, to have a cry in the wilderness. Uh, you are um, doing important work. We know that you are not many people who, who care very much for the environment, unfortunately, in Palestine. And we, it's our job and responsibility all to encourage one another um, who are doing the amazing work so that we take care of all God's creation, not only human beings, but also um, plants, animals, um, we're all God's creation and we need to respect.
uh, life, wherever it is. Definitely. Dr. Anton, um, we thank you very much for your time, and it has been a very interesting um, meeting with you. Thank you. I, very uh, Thanks a lot, but I want to say one thing. I want to say a big thank to Paul Seligman. He came to Palestine, I think, two years ago, and we did a bird watching together. He's, he's with us on the on the line right now. So hi, uh, 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 Paul. Thanks a lot, guys, and uh, hopefully we'll meet uh, again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.